onto with that vibrate because sometimes that one's always hallelujah so uh, one example is a lady says oh, I've been trying to listen to because I give them certain instructions um, pastor my computer everything is just not working you know like when when the enemy really wants to stop or hinder someone getting their breakthrough you can find that those yeah. spirits that have dominion over those places can stop them from listening full stop so you know to prevent the um, prevent the deliverance or prevent the breakthrough so we're going to look at that and we're going to look at the obviously you know we know that there are many authors today that have written many books um, of people that have come out of witchcraft that were warlocks or were witch doctors or were you know we've, we've read many of them and come across them and some of them have given us insights into what the plans of the enemy are against the church so we can learn a lot from those things but the key is is what what we're going to look at today is living a holy life actually protects you from these things but it's a good thing not to be naive to what the devil does because obviously being an itinerant minister as i was a lot in the earlier days i would come across some pretty weird things and i'm like wow why am i in this situation but god allows you to be put into those situations uh, to bring those people out from those situations so the good news is when you hear successful stories of people coming into freedom and deliverance the sad news is is when people continue <laughs> to be in that deception knowing that the lord doesn't want them to be in that uh, that state forever hallelujah so hallelujah so reggie's just getting ready thank you jesus thank you jesus already on oh praise god hallelujah thank you jesus we give you all the praise so uh this very evening we're going to talk about charismatic witchcraft that's right charismatic witchcraft and as you can hear from the teachings that we've been doing um over this series of uh, a couple of teachings you'll find that we've been focusing focusing a little bit about manipulation of witchcraft we've been fo focusing on the levels of witchcraft We've been talking about witchcraft within the church, but today specifically, we want to focus on charismatic witchcraft. So we can see that uh, not only is witchcraft being exposed within the society, but it's also being exposed within the church. So even a number of converted, obviously, as we were saying, witches and walk locks that have come out of um, witchcraft, have come out of covens, have come out of uh, witch doctors come out of Satanism have come out of all sorts of different things and they've come to explain to us or expose to us and reveal to us the hidden secrets of the enemy so that the church may be aware now most of the time um, you know I remember certain people that would come out of these things it would shock the church because a lot of the church weren't aware of the fact is that the Satan has a plan to go into churches and to cause havoc hallelujah but God has a plan also so let's look at those what are some of those things control intimidation and dominion and manipulation there's some of the characteristics that we could see with witchcraft especially charismatic churches so why is it said charismatic witchcraft unfortunately it seems to manifest within churches of the Pentecostal charismatic movement because there it seems to be a focus on the supernatural it seems to focus on spiritual giftings it doesn't mean that witchcraft does not take place within traditional churches or non-denominational churches it may just manifest in a different way so therefore in a traditional church you may find that witchcraft or charismatic witchcraft or a, a, a white witch staff so to speak may be manifest through the elders of the church controlling the pastor or one particular elder in particular or a deacon within the church may be controlling or using uh, witchcraft manipulation to control that place I know of one in particular in America and I get heaps of emails from people asking me pastor what about this situation that I'm in because I'm coming across this situation with the bishop of the church, his daughter is a lesbian. But 
this lesbian had slept with my father-in-law and my father-in-law keeps on requesting me to send him pictures of me with the what the laundry he gave to me I was like what is going on and this person is also a minister within the church but how does it come to that point it's normally because the the pastor or the bishop has opened up or there is a, a, a sin has come into the church when sin comes into the church, obviously it opens up for a witchcraft control and a flood of sin that just gets worse and worse within the church. So especially charismatic churches. Let's look at that. So some of these former witches who have come out of those things detailed um, diabolical plots by evil witches to enter into congregations posing as super spiritual Christians. Their purpose is to deceive and to shipwreck pastors and to lead multitudes of naive believers into the occult worship through charismatic witchcraft. Now that might seem kind of extreme, but the truth is it is today. And I've been in congregations where I've been ministering under the power of the Holy Spirit preaching the truth of God's word through his scripture. And I have seen pastor's wives. I have seen pastors. I have seen elders in the church. All of a sudden, on the altar of God, as I am preaching with such fire through God's word, those people just start to manifest and nearly knock out the altar that I've been preaching on. And then all of a sudden, those people fly out into the congregation and then the congregation leaves the church and gets scared and doesn't want to return so it is not uncommon for god to expose hidden agents within churches hallelujah and we find that through the word of god is the best uh best antidote to come against with our spiritual sword so many of these evil witches they say are already firmly established in numerous churches controlling both the pastor and the congregation and causing great confusion wickedness divorce and even death and so you know these emails that we're receiving on a daily basis people are sharing things from every continent you can think of in europe in africa in south america in australia in asia you name it we are getting things that would shock you to what people are saying is happening within their churches. So, and believe me, many of these messages or these emails that I'm getting, they're very legitimate. They're not just all someone just making these things up. You can see the sincere sincerity from the people that are sharing some of the things that we will briefly talk about today. So let's define the term because taken separately, the word charisma, it means, and if we look at the dictionary and we look at the synonymous of it, it means to uh, charm, allure, or a dynamic glamour. But once we attach that word to the word charismatic witchcraft, it then becomes something a little bit different than just glamour. But that is true. It is glamorous, meaning it comes with a glamour to deceive people to think that that thing is the genuine thing. But ultimately it comes to what? To control, to intimidate, to dominate, and to manipulate. So let's look at this. So it comes to do those things. So once attached to the word witchcraft, at the highest point of the spectrum, religious charisma bodies of hypnotic mag magnet magnetism um, to a form of magical suggestion which can be ambushed if practiced by people with a self agronized motivation. So the definition of magic is magic from a religion, a religious or spiritual perspective is classified as the true meaning of witchcraft. Witchcraft is manifested according to two distinct types, black magic or white magic. So black magic is uh, Luciferian worship, obviously, uh, practice in the evocation of Satan, devils, and demons for the purpose of persecution, vengeance, and death spells. White magic uses the names of the Trinity 
even Bible verses, and particularly even the Psalms and other religious symbols to invoke prosperity, health and healing, protection, destiny, purpose, romance, finances, and fertility. So we're seeing in a nutshell, like new age mysticism, charismatic witchcraft is the practice of white magic. And we're seeing that displayed within many circles, even within certain teachings we're seeing today. In actual fact, is that most of the big churches or the big movements that we would see today, some of the things that have astonished me is how they allow every single person to prophesy. In actual fact, that started off, I heard one of the reports of one of those people that started this movement, and they said that, you know, they sat around this table and they said to each person, what do you think Jesus would say if he just came into the room? So they all suggested what they thought. And then all of us said, do you realize you all just prophesied? So he started that throughout his whole church. So you've got all these people going around telling you, this is what God's saying, and I feel God saying this and feel God saying that. Despite of the fact that Jeremiah says, be careful of those that come to you vainly with false prophecies, saying they have prophesied vainly from their hearts, but it is not what God is saying. How many people do we see today going around giving false prophecies, but those things never come to pass? And that is a danger because there are some things we've got to be careful about. One is, I've always said to people, be careful how you prophesy someone will get pregnant. Be careful that if you prophesy someone that will die. Now, it doesn't mean that God is not telling you these things because I believe God showed me that Nelson Mandela would die that very year when I was in South Africa and those things came to pass. Then he showed me another figure of someone that would rise up in the country and stir up racial tension. And to this day, just the other day, I saw that very person who is now trying to promote his separate political party. He is coming out with this with this bitterness and racism to stir up to destroy all the whites within South Africa. And God showed me this when I was there in that country. But I always say to people, be careful you go around saying this person's going to die or that person's going to die. Maybe keep that thing to yourself to pray about that if it's not God's will that it won't come to pass. Another thing is you've always got to be careful about prophesying who is to marry another person. Because many people have gone and prophesied that and I've seen even some well-known you know, uh, personal prophetic word of knowledge prophets that come to this city and to other cities. And those people that got married, they were divorced within a month because it was not the Spirit of God. We've got to be very careful that we don't cross over into that element of the flesh so that God may be glorified. Hallelujah. So, in a nutshell, like New Age mysticism, Charismatic witchcraft is the, pra is the practice of white magic. For the sake of comparison, consider how both a New Age practitioner and a charismatic Christian in some circles would approach a typical problem. Now, let me look at this. When a woman in a certain place or certain continent, whether it be Africa, whether it be South America, whatever it is, if generally, if you're in Africa, and you had a problem or that you were wanting to seek a man, what would happen is that that person would return back to their regional home. Whenever those people return back to the regional home, it's because they want to consult with the traditions of that land. They want to consult with witchcraft. If you're in East Timor and you want to, you're a politician and you want to get favor in politics, they will return back to their hometown, their home village, to consult with the local medium. And what will happen typically with someone that's having problems within a marriage, if you were consulting with witchcraft, you would go and consult with that witch doctor, with that, um, with the black magic, whatever it is, whatever, whatever name or title it is, and you will go and consult with that person to how you are to deal with that problem. And namely, what will they do? So it's common when a woman is desperate, she will do this. She will go and consult this. She will be told to purchase a defense enchantment, 
like an example, like burying a man's shirt at full moon. And while pronouncing a curse or a magic formula seven times, as the shirt wears out and disintegrates in the ground over time, so also would the, would the man's love for another woman fade and dissolve. And they will, they will do this. So they will win men through witchcraft. And then when they become born again, then all of a sudden the husband, the witchcraft wears off. Now the husband's like, I don't even love you. Right? And then there's trouble. And then the lady says, oh, my husband, I've got so much trouble with him. It's because she used witchcraft power to initially, what? To initially grab that person. But then, when we look at both sides, so both the occultists and those using charismatic witchcraft rely on the gullibility and the readiness of those they cancel and advise. So the only people that allow these witch doctors to exist are those gullible people that are still paying the money. And so it is with charismatic witchcraft when we've got some people in the church that are practicing in the new age the only people that are allowing them to continue are those that are supporting them, isn't it? So, in a like-minded manner, charismatic witchcraft might approach the classic problem in this case to deal with a husband, right? And they may come across and say, look, I've been given a supernatural dream. I've been given this, I've been given that. And then all of a sudden, that person will start to pray witchcraft prayers. And they come to me all the time. They'll say to me, oh, pastor, can you please join in agreement with me that that strange woman will be destroyed? And I said, hang on a minute. I said, I ain't in agreement with that prayer because that is witchcraft. You can't pray like that. You've got to pray the person will come to repentance. If you're dealing with the spiritual element, yes, you can pray that prayer. But when you're dealing with another person, because God does not delight in the death of the wicked, let me tell you. He wants all men to come to repentance, no matter how bad they are. But when we're dealing with fallen angels, when we're dealing with spiritual things, yes, we have to do that in the spirit to come against the spiritual, but not the person itself. We can't say, we can't start saying prayers of manipulation. I want this person dead. Da, 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 da. You can't do that because then it becomes another form of charismatic witchcraft and we've got to be careful right so so we can see that the two though those people had come out of witchcraft come out of the traditions now they find themselves falling into the trap of charismatic witchcraft and that's one thing we've got to be careful of because the truth is if a witch doctor came dancing down the aisle with his with his painted face, with fe feathers, fetishes, and rattles, and most evangelical churches would have enough discernment to run out. Even an evangelical church will be able to see the difference. How much more for a Pentecostal or for a charismatic church? They should know that that's not right. But today, we see practicing of things happening on the altar of God. It is common for those that come from New Zealand they come and do the, what do you call it? The haka. They do the haka on the altar. That is not of God. Or if you come and do indigenous stuff on the altar, no matter which country it is, it is not of God. You don't do those things on the altar because it is holy. You've got to keep that thing holy. So what happens? But because many churches are allowing things to come in and not knowing what those things are. But if a real witch was to come in, dressed as though that he had all of his things, doing all of his different things, people would probably run out, isn't it? But the same witch doctor may come in. He might have minus the outward adornments of his occultism. He's dressed now in a business suit with nice shiny shoes. Maybe he, some of these things have changed. And with a PhD, even in psychology, and teaching success principles allegedly from the Bible, mind you, um, we would welcome them and listen to them very intently. But it's the same person, just disguised as something else. That's what we're seeing happening in the church. Because a lot of the time, most people, when they come out of occultism, 
or when they come out of a family line of a generational sin, there hasn't been pure deliverance. So therefore, when people come into the charismatic churches, when they come into the Pentecostal churches, sometimes those gifts can be celebrated rather than those things be delivered. And those people come around and start to give false prophecies, isn't it? But it's not the same spirit. It's not the spirit of God. Now, we're not, we're not attacking because we believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But I'm just saying there must be some type of warning that's also put out there to the churches to say, hey, test the spirit. No one seems to be testing the spirit anymore. They're just saying, yes, that must be God. This person's from here. We'll just receive them. You've got to test the spirit to make sure that those people are coming from the right source. Hallelujah. So one of the world's leading anthropologists and authorities of shamanism, which is a <laughs> modern word for witchcraft, lists the new names under which basic elements of ancient witchcraft are now widely accepted in today's world and church. Visualization, hypnosis, psych psychological counseling, positive thinking, positive speaking, confession, and Eastern uh, med uh, meditation and techniques. A lot of these things are being practiced and allowed in churches and no one is saying anything about it and the truth is all we need is God's Word God's Word Amen. when I was preaching God's Word the demons in those elders the demons in the pastors the demons in the pastor's wife came out Amen. not because I was <laughs> preaching psychology no demons gonna come out through psychology or me saying you're gonna have a good day and you're gonna be blessed and just that. No, I've never seen no demon come out like that. But when I preach the word of God in truth, those demons wanna come out. Amen. Hallelujah. So saints, we in the body of Christ dare not allow the devil's power to be magnified within the house of God, despite of the claims of the witches or former warlocks that have said, hey, there are witches that have come into your church and you don't even know. They're controlling the congregation. They're controlling the power. But I'm here to tell you, as a believer in Jesus Christ, we should not allow any demon to have any power over us. We are more than conquerors. His power is limited. And he cannot penetrate a Holy Ghost wall of fire because God is present. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When the disciples were sent out with power to heal the sick and raise the dead, they became back rejoicing. What did they say? Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he even said to them, don't rejoice in that, but rejoice your name is written in the book of life. Hallelujah. It is not so much the gifting. Let's not celebrate that. Let's celebrate Jesus Christ. Let's celebrate salvation. Let's celebrate the cross. That's where the power is. The gifts and things will just follow. They shouldn't be something we're seeking first because you can manifest in the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, but still not make heaven. It is better to bear the fruit of God and then allow the gifts to flow as the Holy Spirit suggests. So the only pastor who can fall under the control of the witch is one that indulges in secret sin. Let me tell you, a lot of pastors have fallen because when the anointing increases upon your life as a Christian, as a believer, it will also, when the anointing increases, it will also bring up anything that's not of God. Anything that's hidden, it will come to the surface. You may think you're going to hide it now, but it will come to the surface. That's why so many pastors have fallen into homosexuality. They've fallen into alcoholism. They've fallen into adultery. They've fallen into pornography. Because there was something there and that didn't come to the surface. They didn't bring it to the surface. And you will never grow to where God wants you to. See, that secret sin who is driven, and maybe that pastor is driven by what? Is driven by greed or success. Or who has betrayed the Lord through unbelief or neglect. 
Some of these things can creep in. A man of God who has mortified the deeds of the flesh and wields the sword of the Lord will know the enemy. Hallelujah. He'll be able to spot that enemy. He'll be able to spot it in a person. He'll be able to spot a Jezebel spirit. He'll be able to spot an Ahab spirit. He'll be able to spot the charismatic witchcraft easily. And those demons will come out of those people generally if they are humble enough. Hallelujah. So he will discern any trap and will stand against the wicked one as Paul did with the witch in the Philippi. Hallelujah. So here's what happened. A slave girl possessed by the devil that is a practicing witch with the spirit of divination sought to infiltrate Paul's ministry. She followed after Paul and his companions crying out this in Acts 16, 17. These men are the servants of the Most High God which they have come to show the way of salvation. Hallelujah. When you come to a church and you are a true servant of God, let me tell you, you will expose everything. And they will know that you're a true servant of God because you can't be touched. Hallelujah. So, but Paul's spirit was disturbed. Why? Because he discerned that the girl was not converted and that she had no right to touch holy things. Hallelujah. He wasn't going to receive any false prophecy of her. What did he turn around to say? He went after her. Hallelujah. He perceived a trap. So he turned and said to the evil spirit in her, according to Acts 16, 18, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And the demon came out that very same hour. That spirit of divination left because the seven of God saw it as being a trap. And that's what charismatic witchcraft is. It is a trap to come against us, to hinder, to stop us from coming into the fullness that Christ has for the church. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's look at this. Paul was unmoved by the demons and the demon powers. He was led by the Holy Spirit and full of the word of God. But the Bible tells of one group of supposed ministers that who were? They were attacked, literally, and overcome by a demon. And they were the seven sons of Sceva. When they tried to cast out the demon out of a man, the evil spirit leaped on them, tore off their clothes, and sent them running into the street in a panic. Hallelujah. All because they didn't know Jesus. They were not full of Christ. If you ain't full of Christ... No demon in hell is going to be scared of you. But when you are full of Christ, there is no entry point for no demon to come against you. Acts 19 verse 13. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exodus took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so, and the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on, overpowered them, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. This is because no one both to all the Jews and the Gentiles. And what happened? It brought a multitude to fear God. As a result, those demons caused a revival because they addressed, the. they knew who really had the authority. It was Paul and Jesus they knew, but they didn't know these servants. And so it is today. There are many servants that are out there that Jesus and the demons do not know. If they know the word of God and they tremble, why do some servants know the word of God, but they don't even tremble to continue to be in their sins? No congregation that walks in holiness and the fear of God can be deceived or controlled by witches or evil spirits. Only pleasure, only pleasure, mad, Bible and holy rejecting churches are open to Satan's attempt to move upon them. When we reject holiness... When we reject righteousness, when we reject God's word, that is when we open ourselves up to the philosophies of this world to come in. And the eloquence of speech above the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's what we have today. 
whether the word of God is exalted, wherever people separate themselves from wickedness and the world, wherever there is true repentance and obedience to the Holy Ghost, there Jesus will manifest his presence. Hallelujah. A congregation that is bathed in the presence of Jesus doesn't have to scream commands at wicked powers. The very power of Jesus drives out all of that wicked. Hallelujah. Satan and his evil hordes simply cannot coexist with Christ's presence. Hallelujah. We resist the devil to being full of Jesus. When we are full of Jesus, it makes everything easier in ministry. Hallelujah. Because the devil can't stand it. We resist the devil by being full of Jesus, by living and worshipping what? In his presence. Hallelujah. Are there any real churches today? Are there any pastors today that are fallen under the control of witches and demons? Absolutely, yes. They are there. I know one in particular. I met a particular pastor from a particular nation. Probably not, I'll just say, I'll just leave out the nation completely. Hallelujah. <laughs> to save the identity. One particular pastor, his father had abused his children. And then I found out that they had gone to the same church for many years. Then I found out that the pastor had been in adulterous relationships and also pedophile relationships within the church. So therefore, he was a good friend with the father of this young pastor who had had his children molested by the father. Then all of a sudden, this, this, this young pastor went to proceed to tell me to say that his father left his mother and went after another woman who was much younger. And the pastor stood by him. The pastor stood by him when the, uh, when the accounts happened for the pedophilia against his own grandchildren. And he said, just said to forgive, just to forgive. And then all of a sudden when the, the father leaves for another younger woman, he then goes over to continue to say, oh, just forgive, forgive. And then all of a sudden this pastor then goes and starts his own ministry. And then in a short period of time, he now has left his wife with four children to go after a younger woman. Why? Because that church allowed sin to come in through the pastor. The pastor had opened up a huge floodgate for sin to come into that church and to say it is all right. There is no consequences for your sin. We know God is the judge. But when pastors or ministers openly try to support sin, be careful. Don't ever touch being there trying to encourage divorce. There are many pastors today encouraging people to get a divorce as though it's like getting another uh, packet of Wheaties from the shop. We should not. We should do everything to maintain God's integrity. There are some marriages where I wouldn't encourage you to stay in if you're completely being abused and whatnot. But there are it's always an opportunity for reconciliation if the, those things, have, the bridges have not been burnt too far. But there are pastors today, they come to you and tell you that you've got a scratch in your nose and then they'll tell you to take your nose off <laughs> without even giving you any wisdom and saying it's only a scratch, you don't need to do that. Let's look at another one. I heard of a, one particular large church was wholly given over to Satan. How can that be? A Pentecostal church given wholly over to Satan. How can that happen? The pastor had a lustful, evil spirit. He committed one act of adultery after another, and soon his wife became involved. The pastor and his wife eventually introduced something into the congregation called Connections. They developed an entire doctrine around connections, right? First, they brought ballroom dancing into the sanctuary. The pastor told the pastor of the people to look into their partner's eyes until the Holy Spirit made a connection. The pastor, leaders and deacons became involved. They began swapping wives. They had a swapping wives thing. They, they become swingers within the church. Right? 
they started swinging and committing adultery. Before long, it all became chaotic. Divorce became rampant. Parishioners began having nervous breakdowns. The pastor's son committed suicide. His daughter divorced and ran off with another man. More, su more suicides broke out. One young mother was so distraught over her husband's leaving her that she drowned her baby in a bathtub so the baby's soul would be safe with Jesus. That church has been utterly destroyed because of a pastor that opened himself up to sin. That is where the transference of spirit comes through the laying of hands and sitting under someone that is living a wrong life. You can't live secret lives. They always come to the surface. The church has been utterly destroyed. It is embroiled today in numerous lawsuits, all because of the unbridled lust of a backslidden pastor. The one man... That one man, full of Satan, opened up his entire flock of demonic powers. What if someone had discernment or the pastor realized that he could go and get some help? We're seeing that problem today that pastors are not seeking to get help, but they are staying in those hidden sins. Let me tell you, if you stay in your hidden sin, it will come and bite you one day. It will come and bite you. Another story, when I was in Brazil, there was a particular pastor. He was going around giving pro false prophecies to a lot of people, telling people that they would marry this one and they would marry this one. They're all marrying the wrong people. And then when problems come in the marriage, then you wonder why. Because someone has given false prophecies to say, you're to marry this one, you're to marry that one. We cannot manipulate the things of God. Another story. Another pastor who thought it was good that he should have two wives and he thought he could hide the second wife until all things got exposed. You can't be with a servant of righteousness without things getting exposed. They will come to you. They will come to me in a dream. It will come to me in whatever. It always gets exposed. I don't want it. I don't really ask for it. But God puts you there so that you can bring right order. That's what God does. He will bring his servants to always give a warning to each of us when we've gone too far. Hallelujah. Yet this message has to do with all kinds of witchcraft that are even more dangerous than that. And it is, it is a lot more subtle of some of the things that we're going to talk about. It is brought into the church, not by evil, not just by evil shepherds, not just by witches alone, but the multitudes of Christians who don't know they are under the spell of witchcraft. And that generally is disobedience to the word of God. The kind of witchcraft I want to expose is present in most circles, not only Pentecostal charismatic churches, but all churches. It may only seem to be a seed to some, but it is still there. It is also prevalent within traditional and non-denominational churches, but can come in different flavors. You ask, how could the devil possibly deceive God's elect with occult seductions? No, that's too obvious. We can easily discern the devices of Satan in that area. No, he comes to us in another way. He attacks very subtly. As I said, if a witch came down in his outfit and doing all that stuff, you'd probably reject it. So would you if the devil came into your house and said, I'm going to destroy your family. You would quickly start throwing out whatever you need to throw out of your house or do whatever to get in line with the God. But the devil doesn't do that. He comes in subtly. To some, he might come in that way. Because they've opened up the doors to extreme things. But most of the time he will come in subtly. So what is charismatic witchcraft? Well, let's continue to look at some other examples. It could be an intercessor praying that the pastor would take the church in a different direction. That is common. It's a young woman praying that a certain man would have feelings for her. When that relationship is not supposed to be together. You can't manipulate those things. I get those emails all the time. 
It could be an individual who gives parking lots prophecies. What I mean by parking lot prophecies is they wait to the end of church and they go out and start giving false prophecies to people. And all it does is bring confusion. Or laying of hands on another with the intent of what? Forcing a desire on them through spiritual means. For this reason, many ministers have shied away from teaching the saints the true word of God concerning spiritual gifting. Why? Because they don't want to deal with charismatic witchcraft in their churches. And then there is the other extreme of churches. They just let anything happen. And you've got so many false prophecies. There's one particular um, uh, apologist who was a Muslim converted Christian. And he went to one particular church. And so many people had prophesied over him that he would be healed. He never got healed. He died. So what, what's wrong? It was false prophecy, wasn't it? It was false prophecy. They prophesied, God told me God would heal you. It's better not to say it if you're not sure. Unless God specifically showed it. And if it didn't come to pass, then it shows that it was false. So, we're going to expose charismatic witchcraft. Yep. I'm not afraid to deal with it. And a, a lot of people are because they don't want to upset someone. But I think it's important for us to look into. Somebody may say in their heart, Pastor, you're opening up a can of worms. Well, that's all right. I don't mind. Bring it on. Right? You better believe. And every worm must get exposed. Because if it doesn't, then we'll have blood on our hands. I did not come out of this world, what? To be trapped inside of witchcraft within the church. We didn't come out of this world to come to Christ, to put up with compromise in the church. I don't know about you, but I didn't forsake this whole world to come and follow Jesus Christ, to see this type of behavior going on in his church. And I'm sure he would turn a few tables if he was to return back with some of the things that we're seeing within the church today. Is it a problem? Yes, it is a problem. Just like adultery or fornication in the church, it requires deliverance and the teaching of the Word of God to destroy it. Hallelujah. Amen. It's destroying people. It's not people. It's not a person. It's a problem. It's not people. It's not a person. It is a problem that we're facing here. We're not pointing names, we're not pointing at any particular ministries, but we're saying that, hey, it is prevalent within the church today. We have no right to control all of us. God gave us a free will, and even he will not try to control us. Therefore, we enter into agreement with Satan and his demons when we attempt to control others, and we are practicing witchcraft. We don't wanna do that. I can't control others. People will do what they want to do, but they, at the same time, they must be warned, isn't it? If people aren't warned, how will they know? The Bible says, how will they, how will they hear if no one preaches to them? So if no one's bold enough to say anything, how is people going to know? So witchcraft is the practice of trying to control others for personal gain. Charismatic witchcraft is exercising control over other Christians, not only leaders, but anyone within the church. Charismatic witches use personal prophecy and dreams and visions to control others. Soul ties are formed with those to whom we submit our will. Soul ties can be formed with also leaders of the church as well as anyone within the occult that we go to for help. When you submit yourself to a false prophecy, you have now submitted yourself to that person. You've got to reject it. Or you've got to say, thank you so much, I'm going to test the spirit of this. And you reject it. Not every dream I get, I put, I put up here on the top shelf. Sometimes I throw them in the waste pastor. Some people come to me with dreams, I say, yeah, that's right. I accept that. Some of them are junk. I say, yeah, thank you so much. I don't, I don't muck around. I don't entertain things that you know with that gift of discernment through the Word of God. Does it match up with the Word of God? That should be the number one thing. Someone comes to me and says, oh, pastor, the Lord's given me a dream and I'm going to marry another husband. But they're still married. How is that possible? It is common. 
And people, because we go to charismatic Pentecostal churches, we say, oh, I had this vision, I had this stuff. But some, some of the polony that's coming out is, is not. You can't say, well, I, I just seen a blue elephant. Ah, and then shake your head like this. What is the point? What is the blue elephant going to do for you? It's not going to do anything. So soul ties are formed with those who we submit our will. Soul ties can be formed with also leaders of the church and so forth and anyone that's giving this stuff. What else happens? There's another form of uh, charismatic witchcraft. It's just control in the church and many cults have done that. Many cults have done that. There are big ones that we have seen before that uh, if you do anything against them, they will take you to the authorities. There's one country at the moment that people that are exposing that person are being taken to court, thrown and, and threatened to be taken into jail because that cult has a very big following within those nations. So when you stand up for the truth, that spirit doesn't like it. And some people are being persecuted as a result of those things. Remember, Queen Jezebel was a prime example of controlling others. A Jezebelic uh, woman is actually practicing witchcraft as she tries to control her family. Or, in other words, a narcissist husband, which is like a Jezebel husband, controlling his family extremely with no love. Charismatic witches are Jezebels. A lot can be written about this subject, but there are many demons associated with the controlling of others. And this practice is basically mind control. And that's what happens. Demons use kinds of openings to counterfeit the Holy Spirit, and then they come in. In fact, that white magic practitioners who attend Christian churches are so shackled to the sin of idolatry, they refuse uh, they re uh, that release from demonic captivity is obtainable without thorough confession and renunciation of the charismatic witchcraft. You've got to really want this stuff to leave. The kundalini spirits and everything else coming into the church today, they ain't going to go until you fully renounce those things. And this subject we're going to move into is witchcraft prayer. Specifically, how do you avoid witchcraft prayer? And most importantly, how do you pray correctly such that prayers are actually get answered? What is witchcraft prayer? Witchcraft prayer is any prayer that is prayed out of the desire to manipulate another person. Prayers prayed in an attempt to manipulate my sound, in, um, you know, in, any any situation or a person's innocent or even spiritual, Lord, it's a manifestation or manipulation is never from God. You can't do that. You can't manipulate somebody through prayer. Some examples of manipulated prayer would be what? Dear God, I pray that, let's just say, Mr. Smith would give me a job. I pray that this person would give me a job. Right? That's, that's not a prayer that God wants us to pray. Or another one. Father, I pray that the Jones family would give me $100 million to this cause. They know that they have to give it in Jesus' name. That's not, that's not the right prayer. Or oh Lord, please make my husband start treating me right. That's not the type of prayer that we need to pray. Or, Lord, I want to win the lotto this weekend. How many people have heard say that? One parable I'm out of here. God's going to... That's witchcraft. You can't manipulate God that way. Prayers like this are commonly referred to as witchcraft prayers because it's like you're trying to speak incantations over a person to conjure up the result you want. Prayers like this is dangerous. It opens the door to the enemy to operate in your life. And God can, can honor a spirit, can't honor a spirit of manipulation. God honors freedom, not manipulation. Therefore, we must avoid witchcraft prayers at all cost. But here's the thing. We all want the results in prayers, don't we? The entire purpose of praying is getting God to answer and get those answers from God. So how do we pray properly so that we can get the answers we desire from God and desperately 
who wants to give those things. As he even says, if you ask, you shall receive. If you seek and you shall find. If you knock, the door shall be open to you. If you ask for a, a bread, he's not going to give you a scorpion, is he? God wants to give his children good things. But we've got to learn to pray. So the secret to effective answered prayers to pray in the sympathy with the heart of Jesus Christ, with the heart of the Father. 1 John 4, 16 says, And we know and believe that the love of God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God is in him. Hallelujah. When you pray from the heart of compassion and love, God will answer. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 says, Blessed be God our Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our tribulations, that we may be able to comfort those who are in, in any trouble with the comfort with which ourselves are comforted. Hallelujah. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. When you pray with a heart of love, with a heart of compassion, God will bring those things to pass. Instead of praying just because we want something, we must pray for the things Jesus wants. We must look at the heart of Jesus for the person or the situation and pray for God's will into that situation and for that person. Hallelujah. Let me give you an example. If there was disunity within a church, we would pray for unity because Christ brought and paid for unity in his body when all of his bones were ripped out of their joints. Now, no bones were breaking on Jesus that fulfills scriptures, but it doesn't say his ligaments were pulled. When they pulled his hands, his ligaments were broken. He became broken for us. Hallelujah. That's why it says in Psalm 22, 14, I am poured out like water and all my bones out are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It was, it has melted within me. And then we got Psalm 133, verse 1 to 3. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down of the beard of the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garment. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commands a blessing like forevermore. God always commands a blessing for unity when brethren dwell in unity. Hallelujah. If a person needed salvation, we pray for their salvation so that the inheritance of Christ would be feel, fully realized. Why? We pray through scripture. Isaiah 53 verse 11. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant shall justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. Jesus became one to bring many unto salvation. Psalm 51 12 verse 13. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and help behold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and shin sinners shall be converted to you. Amen. When you pray for the scripture, you can't be enticed into witchcraft manipulated prayers, because you're praying directly using scripture for the benefit of the person, for the benefit of the situation, and also with the heart of love and compassion. If someone needed healing, we must pray for their healing because Jesus brought and paid for their healing on the cross. That's why Isaiah 53 verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. That's why when we pray over people, we pray scriptures. It is a safer way to go than to pray manipulative prayers. If prov provision was needed. So we must pray it in because God says his children shall not lack. Why? Because Psalm 23 verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Hallelujah. Philippians 4.19. And my God shall supply for all of our needs according to his riches of glory in Christ Jesus. When we stand upon his word, we remove the manipulation aspect of it. The word is the safest way to pray. Hallelujah into the will of God for that person or for the situation. Find out what God's will is. God's will is not a mystery. It's clearly laid out in the Bible. So find his promise 
or the description of what Jesus paid for on the cross or his or and pray for that very thing to take place. Let's look at this. Pray because you want the Father's heart to be satisfied by seeing his will accomplished on the earth. Pray because you want Jesus to receive his full inheritance. Pray because you want the Holy Spirit not to be grieved. Pray because you want the Father's plan for your life to be fully manifest. Pray because you want the Father's plan to be manifest in those that you love. Hallelujah. Pray because you want God's kingdom and the government to increase in your life and in the lives of others. Pray the will of God and pray the word of God. Hallelujah. Let's look at some other examples. What's a better way to pray? Maybe you're praying for your husband who doesn't treat you very well. Father, I pray that you would fill my husband with your spirit. Help him love righteousness and hate sin. Let him love like you love. I pray that you would give him all wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. Let him see you, love you, honor you in everything. Amen. Imagine the prodigal son. He said, you know what? I just want my whole inheritance down. The father couldn't say to him, no, don't go. He couldn't manipulate him. He couldn't control him. He had to give what he requested. He had to go. He had to spurge all of his money. It had to come to the point that he was even eating with the pigs. The father could not change, could not manipulate, could not do anything to bring him home. All he could say was, I pray my son will come to know you more. Isn't it? That's the correct prayer. You can't manipulate God. But God himself is in the business of humbling us. He will humble that person and bring them back to him. We don't have to say, Lord, I pray you just humble them now. We don't say that. We say, Lord, I pray that they will come to know you for that person and for that circumstance. With the heart of love. Otherwise, it becomes like witchcraft, right? Or maybe you need a job. Father, I pray that you would direct my steps and bring me into the job that you have for me. If this is the one, then Father, grant me your favor. Be the answer of my tongue in this interview. Show me what to say and when to say it. And let me be a blessing to my employee. But if this job isn't the one that you desire for me, then I pray you'd protect me from it. No matter what, I know it's your desire to bless me. Please perfect those things that concern me and guard my steps so that your plan may come to its fruition. Amen. Hallelujah. How many of us are open to say, Lord, don't even let me get this job, but this is not of you. Some of us are so desperate, we'll take any job that we get. And then all of a sudden we find out we're in a bad job. We wonder why. Or maybe your friends are coming against you. Father, according to Galatians 5, 23, verse 24, I pray that you would fill them with the fruit of the Spirit. Let them each exhibit Christ to one another. Let them love and prefer one another. Pour out your spirit of humanity on each of them and bring peace into the situation. You can't say, Lord, change them or change their heart or do... No, no, no. You've just got to pray for more of God to come into those people's lives. If people choose to leave or go as a pastor, all I can do is pray for them. Pray God would prosper them. Pray God would bless them. Pray God would come to know them more. That is the correct way of praying. We can't manipulate God to bring people back. That is not our business. What's another form? Rebellion. Rebellion is what? The sin of witchcraft. 1 Samuel 15, 23. When the Lord showed me the kind of witchcraft present in the church today, it shook my soul and it was revealed in 1 Samuel 15, 22. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is the iniquity of idolatry. I believe people are rebellious, not so much to me, but to God. When we're rebellious to God, he says what? If you love me, you'll obey me. But people don't like to obey God and obey his word. They like to do their own thing. 
They will, they will even profess to you to be a Christian and all these different things. But their life is not obedient to God. So therefore, they are rebellious to God because they don't honor His Word. The Bible describes here witchcraft far more dangerous than the occult. It controls more pastors and congregations than any other kind of demonic influence. It is a rebellion against the Word of God. Don't be quick to pick up and relax and think, well, this message has got nothing to do with me. Because I think that every single one of us, this we can take this on board. I'm not rebellious against God's word. I love the word. I'm walking in obedience. That's what I thought too. But when God convicted me of the dangers of falling upon the spell of this witchcraft, he showed me the seed of its beginning, exactly what erupted in the Garden of Eden. We all have the same seed of this sin. In fact, we're all conceived into sin. So we have the original sin within us. But not until now have I seen it in the witchcraft that Jesus was exposing. And he exposed it even within this parable of the wicked vine dressers, according to Matthew 21, verse 33 onwards. It says, here, another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. And he leased it to the vine dressers and went into the far country. Now, when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And when the vine dressers took his servants, he beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Again he sent other servants. More than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then the last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, They will, they will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said amongst themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him, cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will they do to those vine dressers? Then they said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to another vine dressers who will render to him the fruit in its season. Now, this parable is more than the retelling of how the Jews rejected Jesus Christ. I believe that we can learn something even deeper from this. Let's cast aside those things. It is also a great supernatural battle over an inheritance. It is about a battle between the power of Jesus Christ and the power of Satan for the souls and the allegiance of all mankind. It is about who is going to rule and reign in the hearts of God's chosen and beloved. You're either under the power of Jesus Christ or you're under the influence of Satan. You see, this parable is about how the people of God can become bewitched by the devil and end up totally possessed by an antichrist spirit. Christ was, ta was, was talking here of the most powerful form of of witchcraft, which is rebellion against the truth. Here is the key to this parable. When we look at verse 38, it says, But when the vine dressers saw the sun, they said amongst themselves, This is the heir, come let us kill him and seize his inheritance. That is the devil speaking. Let us create rebellion against the sun. Let us crucify him and we will take control. It is true that when the Pharisees heard this parable, according to verse 45, it says they perceive that he spoke of them. Hmm. Let's look at uh, Hebrews 6 verse 5. But Jesus is also speaking to the church. Because Hebrews 6 5 says we find a people who have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the word to come. But they have rejected the Bible goes on to say that they have placed him onto the cross a second time. There is no repentance for those that have tasted this good word. He is talking to the church of Jesus Christ. Some have already gone too far 
as did with these Pharisees. In verse 41, it says, He will miserably destroy those wicked men. Others are falling deeper and deeper into the devil's snare and only a thunderbolt from heaven can wake them up and tell them of the danger that is happening within those churches. Some of them are so far from understanding what's going on. The sin that has crept into the church that is accepted and tolerated and is no longer rebuked from the altar is because that pastor decided not to make a stand. Because of fear of the support of man, isn't it? You know, that's one thing I realized. God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. Hallelujah. But God and man are two different things. Actually, I'm very limited. Brother Tree might ring me, but I'm limited because I'm in another place. Or the reception's God. But God is omnipresent. He's always there. And you know what? Man will let you down. I may not be contactable even for my wife at times when I'm overseas. It shows the limitless. God has created you to have a limit. So therefore, that you go to God. God created all of us to be limited so that we could go directly to God. Hallelujah. We don't have to go to man. We go directly to God. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to learn to go to Him directly. Some person said to me, Pastor, can I ring you? He was ringing from Canada. I think I I must have been in the middle of the night. And I sent back to him and I said, I said, I'm sorry, but I'm not able to be with you all the time. And that's why I came up this way. I said, God is omnipresent and he has limited us so that you could go to him and not to me. He didn't create me to be a um, 24-7 God. I am not God. All I'm there is to help you connect you to God. When you listen to the prayers, it's to get you connected to God, not to me, to God. He is the one that's omnipresent. He created me to have limitations. He created you to have limitations. But there is no limitations with God. He is everywhere. He's omnipresent. Hallelujah. Curse is the man that puts their trust in man. But God, he will never let us down. Hallelujah. So let's look at this. Jesus, you simply cannot go on with roots of bitterness. You cannot go on green with envy and jealousy. You cannot go on wounded or hurt or blaming others. You cannot go on disregarding the clear hand of God unless you have lost your reverence for Jesus Christ? Have you lost your reverence for Jesus Christ? Otherwise, it is danger. In actual fact, there's probably no possibility of you coming back. That's what the Bible says. For them to repent, it's impossible. Jesus is standing at your heart's door and he's standing there knocking even right now. He is saying, the Father sent me. Show me your fruit, your obedience. You were planted in good soil. You have had time to grow. What kind of harvest do you have for me? That's what God is going to say to each of us. Reverence for Jesus is not a feeling. It is not words. Respect and reverence mean doing what he said. It means doing his word. Laying aside all the hurts and putting yourself completely in his hands. Saying, God, you're testing me. And you're going to require, am I going to bear that fruit? Because the servants are coming. They're being sent. The prophets are coming. The pastors are coming. The visitor pastor, wherever it is, wherever you are, whatever place you're in. Maybe it's YouTube. YouTube people are coming to you. Preaching the word of God. Hallelujah. If you put down this message and still you're clinging on to your wounds, holding on to your grudges or justifying your bitterness, you will not only disrespect Christ, but you will also put him to an open shame and crucifixion once again. There is hope for the rebellious. Hallelujah. 
the Bible says, Beloved, according to Psalm 107, verse 9 to 14, For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because they've rebelled against the words of God and condemned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, he built or brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble and he saved them from their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and broke their bands of, of under. God has not given us this word of encouragement for those who long to be free and stay in their rebellion. It's about people coming out. Have you been brought down by your rebellion, your bitterness? Cry out to the Lord of hosts for divine deliverance. Let him break the demonic bands around your heart and bring you out of the shadow of death and into his marvelous light. Amen. We've got to break the powers of darkness. Have you been rebellious to God's word? Have you been rebellious to what he wants from you? It's not about us, it's about him. And he is going to come back as it is in that parable. And he will come back to collect what fruit, just like the parable of the fig tree within the vineyard. He came back and says, is there any fruit? He and then he said to the, to, the, to the one that was there that was looking after the place, he says, I will come back in one year and you must cultivate it. Sometimes we are placed in places where we receive such messages. It requires change. It requires us to change to come into God's perfect will. We've got to turn our rebellion away from God and come back to Him. So that Hebrews 6 verses 5 to 6 doesn't come to pass. They are very daunting words to think that God would not forgive us. Because we put Jesus Christ to the cross a second time because of our lifestyles. Because of what we think Christianity is. God is speaking to our hearts. God wants all the areas of charismatic witchcraft or witchcraft or manipulation or intimidation or domin d domination or manipulation to be removed from our lives. He wants us to start to pray effectively with his Holy Spirit, with the word of God, with a heart of love, with a heart of compassion for those that you're praying. God will take care of our enemies. Let me tell you, he will arise. Take care of our enemies. All we need to do is keep on walking, keep on preaching, keep on telling the truth. Because only the truth can set you free. Only the word of God preached in season can set you free. That's what delivers demons. That's what brings down great men and brings them down weeping onto the floor. It is the preaching we need today is turn back to God. Turn away from your rebellion. Turn away from your witchcraft and come back to Jesus Christ. Commit your life to him that he may have his way. We break the power of the ruler demons over every family, over every organization. Over every church, we break demonic ties, bonds and caps. We break soul ties, even to pastors, religious leaders, or any Christian who has been trying to control us. We break curses placed over us of old girlfriends or former boyfriends. We break those soul ties today in the name of Jesus Christ. We break the soul ties of those former business partners that try to dominate us and control us. We break them today in the name of Jesus Christ. We break and we break curses placed upon us by submitting our wills to others. We break the curses brought by charismatic witchcraft and control. We break the curses of Jezebel. We break the curses of Ahab. We renounce false gifts given by Satan. We drive out all demons, demon, demonic works and works of the devil and associated spirits of witchcraft and mind control as follow. We break rejection even by Christian brothers and sisters and passes. Reject
rejection by husbands, wives, mothers and fathers and children. We break the rejection between deliverance workers and pastors. Rejection in the womb. Rejection of self. Rejection of others. Rejections of deliverance. Rejections of every area. Hurts and deep hurts by Christians. Anyone that has touched us that shouldn't have. Inability to give or to receive love. Lord, forgive us and heal us. Lord, any area or any area of lust that needs to be uprooted, remove it today. Any area of addiction to alcohol, drugs or medication, let it be uprooted today. Any false doctrine that needs to come out, any heresy that needs to go, any false preachers, teachers, evangelists or prophets or apostles that need to be broken, any false tongues or prophecy, any false interpretation, demonic spirits, false religion, religious cults, Eastern religions, false love, sweetness, anything, anything that's not of you, false positive thinking, Lord, any soulish faith, any false charismatic movements, any false partial gospel, any false shaking, any false quirking, any false crying, any false putting on a show, any false cooperating, any false discipleship, any false prosperity, any false love of money, any false stinginess, any false think and grow rich, any false money by faith, any false charismatic witchcraft, witches and warlocks, domination, any control, manipulation, or doctrinalation. Lord, we pray any mind control, let it be broken. Any blanking in our minds, let it be broken. Any blocking in our minds, let it be broken. Any binding that needs to be bound, let it be bound. Any confusion, let it be removed. Any witchcraft, any occult, any antichrist spirits, any familiar spirits, any spirits of divination, any spirits of Jezebel, Ahab, or passivity, any distraction of family, or any areas of our life, any lukewarm warmness let it be removed any commanding angels for riches let it be removed any imagery any, any civilization or, or visualization any greed any covetousness any spirit of mammon that's still controlling us any financial poverty or workers or pastors or churches or camp any different gospel any another Jesus that has come into our life any apostate religion or anything that has come against the elect any spirit of error any spirit of this world any aborted spirit, any soul ties and curses, any controlling spirits, any ruler demons over workers or pastors or churches or families, anything of despair or defeat or hopelessness, any strife or contentions or bickering or quarreling among brethren, any inability to work with other Christians, denominational spirits, separation or any infighting, any spiritual pride, ego or vanity or preeminence, any haughtiness, any self-idolatry, we are God or anything that has been pro or programmed within our lives, any worship of man or fear of man, any Mormonism, any, any Jehovah witnessing, anything, any bloodline religions, any Catholicism, any occult, any masonry, any religious demons, any evil eyes, any third eyes, any ma messianic eye, and all the seeing eye, let it be broken today over our lives. Any Christian fantasy, falseness, false love, any play acting, theatrics, affection, or any things that are not of you, any hypnosis or any hypocrisy or lying, deceit, deception, delusion or compromise. We break it today in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. So, Lord, we just thank you that each person has listened today. Lord, we want to come back to you from our rebellion. Maybe we've rebelled against you. Maybe we've said at the beginning... Yes, Lord, we, we obey your word. But maybe there are areas that we have been disobedient. And that is rebellion. We want to repent of that today. So, Lord, we pray today in the name of Jesus. I just want you to repeat this prayer. If you feel it in your heart, just say, Heavenly Father, tonight we repent of every sin of rebellion or any hidden sin that would allow the devil or witchcraft to have any hold over my life. I thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, who died for me. And three days later, he rose from the dead, defeating sin, defeating death. We thank you. I receive Jesus today as my Lord. My God, my God 
God as my personal Savior. Personal and, from today, and from today, we are born again. We are born again. Fill us, Fill us with, your Spirit, with your Holy Spirit from this day forth, this day that, forth we that we will continue on to paths of righteousness, paths of righteousness. For, your for your name's sake. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus mighty name. Amen. 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 And amen. Thank you, Jesus.